Hello everybody, so today we are going to be responding to a video by an individual called Steve Shives. And I'm quite excited about this one. You may not know who Steve Shives is, I'm not sure. But back when I first started getting into YouTube, Steve Shives was kind of my inspiration. And in a way, he still sort of is. Uh, so the reason why he was my inspiration is because I first started getting into YouTube doing response videos to reactionaries and conservatives back in uh, 2014. And it's kind of crazy to think about the fact that back in 2014, LeftTube or BreadTube as it's sometimes called, didn't really exist. And therefore the only channels that I was really aware of that were doing the kinds of things that I was doing were a few like very small anarchist channels and some channels that had basically been mostly atheism channels that had kind of started talking about uh, feminism and stuff like that. Because obviously, if you remember the early 2010s, it was like the big thing around like atheists kind of dividing over whether or not they thought feminism was good or bad. And Steve Shives made a number of videos attacking the men's rights movement and basically advocating for progressive feminism. And this was around the time, like I say, that I first started making responses, also advocating for progressivism and feminism. And therefore, uh, I kind of looked to Steve Shives as like, oh, that's the goal. And indeed, actually, uh, I was turned on to a uh, channel that later became gender critical and in doing so convinced me to become gender critical or played no small part in that uh, by Steve Shives because Steve Shives used to shout out channels at the end of um, his, you know, one of his video segments, he would shout out channels. And one time he gave a shout out to a channel, I went and checked them out and I subscribed to them. And then later on, they started being critical of uh, transgender identity and kind of the nonsense behind it. And that actually was my, to be honest, real first exposure to being like, oh yeah, actually maybe a lot of this stuff is kind of nonsense. So I kind of owe Steve Shives a debt there. He was the person who first turned me on to what would later be revealed to be a gender critical feminist channel. So well done, Steve. But yeah, I just also wanted to say that uh, when I first started off on YouTube and I you know, had less than like 100 subscribers, my big goal was wanting Steve Shives to give my channel a similar shout out. Uh, and I remember when I saw Steve Shives had subscribed to my channel, and I imagine he's probably not anymore, uh, but I was like, oh, great, he's going to see my videos and, and give them a shout out. And that never happened. Not that I'm resentful or anything like that. Now, I did say that I still kind of respect Steve Shives, and I do, uh, admittedly, just because I like how he just keeps trundling along. You know, he's never made it to be like a really big channel. I mean, the video I'm responding to today only has 14,800 views, which, you know, obviously he's, uh, you know, that's that's those would be good numbers for me, but Steve Shives has 127,000 subscribers, which is a lot, uh, but his views have kind of plummeted, but he just keeps going along. And I, I like that. I respect that. Uh, there's something almost kind of wholesome about it. The fact that he's clearly not in this to get the big views. Uh, he, he just regularly uploads videos, just keeps going in it. And that, that is something I respect. Um, now, what I don't think I'm probably going to be coming away from this video saying, or this response video saying, is that I respect Steve Shives' arguments. I did go back and watch a video by uh, Steve because I was looking. So I suppose I should explain. I was just reminded of Steve Shives' existence. And I thought, you know what? I know that Steve Shives affirms trans identity. So let me see if I can find any videos that Mr. Shives has made about this topic. And that's how I found the video I'm going to be responding today. And I'll just reveal now. That video is called Pluto's Not a Planet and Trans Women Are Women. I'm going to address that title in a second. But also I did find another video called Five Stupid Things About Transphobia. And I looked at the video and I'd liked it. So obviously there was a time when I agreed with Steve. But the thing is, I didn't agree with Steve because the arguments were on the side of like, well, obviously biological males can be women. Uh, there are no arguments for that position. And I don't think we're going to see any good arguments in this video here. But yeah, I just thought it was taking a little trip down memory lane to look at somebody who I used to agree with and seeing if, you know, based on the fact I used to agree with them, uh, can they make any arguments that can really uh, work to change my mind on this issue? So let's jump in. Actually, I say let's jump in. Uh, I want to talk about the title right away because immediately it's obvious that this is nonsense. Essentially, what I assume is going to be pointed out is that our definition of terms can change. And that's fine. But the point is, there were a whole load of good arguments given for why Pluto shouldn't be considered a planet. So the question needs to be, uh, are there a whole load of arguments for why uh, biological males uh, who call themselves trans women, why they should be considered women? 
Uh, you know, like that's the funny thing. People will often try to make these arguments of like, well, look, words can change meaning. And it's like, and then they will point to examples of words that have changed meaning. But the point is, when those words did change meaning, it was because there was a good reason for those words to change meaning. There was a good reason for us to categorize things in different ways. And people made arguments for that. They didn't just say that anyone who disagreed was a bigot. And, you know, if I say that Pluto is a planet, then what's going to happen is nobody's going to call me a bigot. Nobody's going to be, you know, like say that I need to shut up and, and just try to just cancel my free speech no matter what. No, what they're probably going to say is, well, why do you think it makes sense to categorize Pluto as a planet? Um, that that would be the, you know, we'd actually have a discussion about the reasons. And obviously, I mean, the example I go to all the time is if I say, I'm a vegan, but I eat meat. And then somebody objects and I say, are you saying words can't change meaning? Well, of course, words can change meaning, but we need to ask, does it make sense for words to change meaning? So this is the point which I'm probably going to elaborate on in the video, but yeah, let's check it out. It was headline news all across the globe. Our understanding of the universe had been expanded. Maps of the solar system were redrawn. Textbooks were rewritten from now on. There Don't forget about the monomics. My very easy method just speeds up naming planets. I mean, where would it be without that? That was probably the, to be fair, the best argument for keeping Pluto's status as a planet was just to maintain that little uh, way of remembering them. Not that you can't just like, monomics is stupid, I hate to say it, but I genuinely think like, for me, it's just easier to remember the different things, uh, but whatever. So long-term fans of the channel will know that uh, sometimes my wireless headphones screw up and I have to use my wired headphones, even though I don't like my wired headphones as much um, for, for a variety of reasons. Um, but no, yeah, my uh, wireless headphones are screwing up again. So let's continue. Astronomers began discovering other objects in Pluto's neighborhood of the solar system. The region where Pluto and these other objects are located was named the Kuiper Belt. Today, around a thousand objects have been identified in the Kuiper Belt. Mm, that seems like a good reason, uh, a very good positive case for why P Pluto shouldn't be considered a planet, because categorizing as such would lead to uh, weird kind of counterintuitive answers like that uh, there are in fact millions or was it like thousands I can't remember the exact number that was given but the, at least there are at least thousands of planets in the solar system you know because if we're going to say Pluto which is just a kind of random uh, you know astronomical object celestial object uh, in a asteroid belt of thousands if we're going to say that's a planet well we'd have to say all the rest of them are planets if you want to be consistent and that's one reason why it doesn't make sense to consider Pluto a planet so that's a good reason uh, and of course yes definitely if you're led to uh, wildly counterintuitive conclusions uh, based on how you categorize certain uh, things that's one reason why you wouldn't want to categorize things that way so for example if you're uh, uh, if you find yourself being led to the counterintuitive conclusion that I would be gay if my fiance decided to identify as a man, that would be a, a reason why you wouldn't want to categorize the categories of man and woman based purely on identity, because that leads you to bizarre counterintuitive conclusions like that I'm either gay or straight and it completely depends on other people's identity. That would be counterintuitive, so we don't do that. I agree. Something being counterintuitive, like there being thousands of planets, if we say Pluto is a planet, was a good reason not to say Pluto was a planet. It's also a good reason to not say trans women are women. And it's theorized that the region may be home to as many as 100,000 objects in total. Then See, in like the scale of space, 100,000 sounds like not very much. Like you're so used to people being like, oh, there are 100 billion galaxies. And like people always use like massive numbers. So like someone says 100,000 and it's kind of like, that's a lot, but it's not like that much. Like usually the kind of uh, scale people talk about when they're talking about astronomy are like astronomical. It'd be like millions of uh, miles and trillions and just like everything's like huge. And they just go, oh, 100,000. It's nothing. Part of the problem was that the definition of planet was too imprecise. So in August of 2006, the International Astronomical Union convened its General Assembly and hammered out a new official definition of a planet. According to the IAU's new definition. It's worth noting, yeah, this is an example of how our definitions, a lot of the time, and I say this all the time, most definitions are based on us already having a general sense of what a word should be describing and then coming up with a definition at work. So for example, most people already know 
what like when I say a planet, just based on like all of kind of the sociological context and just like based on the fact you're a human being who's existed on this planet, when I talk about a planet, you probably have already some idea of what that should be describing before even getting an official technical definition that covers all examples. And this is also true of things like countries, for example, like defining a country uh, is quite a, a difficult thing to do because, okay, we all have an idea of what that should be describing, but actually working out precisely what makes something a country, that's difficult. Uh, and there are many other examples of this. And of course, one example is uh, biological sex. We all have an intuitive idea of what biological sex should be describing. Uh, we all are very much aware of a vast population of males in our society, a vast population of females. Um, but of course, actually pointing to exactly what we are describing, the exact specific thing we're describing when we observe the existence of biological males and biological females, that's a bit more complicated and is an issue where it can actually get contentious at points. Uh, but yeah, that's just a point, And this is another example of that. They had to come up with a definition of a planet, uh, not probably with the expectation that they were going to come up with some definition. It was, you know, they weren't going to come and define a planet as a ceramic thing that you can have hot drinks in with a handle, you know, uh, or whatever else. They weren't going to define it in some completely bizarrely counterintuitive way. No, they were going to define it in a way that basically lined up with people's intuitive sense of what a planet should be, uh, which is, again, like I say, how pretty much all definitions work, and certainly uh, most scientific definitions end up working. Uh, you know, it's kind of like when they officially defined a sentence as, uh, sorry, a sentence, uh, defined a second. Like they defined a second as like the, as something like 300 million vibrations of an athenium atom. I, I don't know science, but you know, like they defined it in some weird way like that. And it's like, okay, they defined it that way so they could have like a strict definition for what it is, but they didn't define a second as like the amount of time it takes you to walk to mcdonald's or whatever because not only would that be not very precise but also it would actually be presumably unless you're very quick or your mcdonald's is very close much longer than a second you know that when they sat down to define second they weren't actually entertaining the possibility they were going to define second to mean something radically different perhaps not even a measurement of time uh people define things already having an idea of what it is that um you know, like they can test whether the definition is correct by working out whether or not it lines up with their intuitive sense of what it makes sense for that word to be describing. So yeah, I just wanted to point that out because I think it's useful when we're talking about definitions to recognize that is the case. Pluto orbits the sun. Pluto is massive enough to have a round shape, but Pluto doesn't clear its neighborhood. It shares its orbit with other Kuiper Belt objects. So, as of August... I'm really interested to see how much the, uh, like, analogy, because we're obviously going to get into it at some point, you know, trans women are women, like, how close this is even going to be in terms of, like, what the argument's going to be. Because obviously, yeah, the argument against why Pluto isn't a planet, I think that's intuitive and obvious, and I think you can all understand, okay, that that's a way of understanding what makes something a planet, which kind of makes sense, you know, and it helps us to distinguish between planets and kind of asteroids or whatever else. 24th, 2006... According to the world's preeminent astronomical organization, Pluto was no longer a planet. I just want to point out, it said a preeminent uh, astronomical organization. It's worth noting, Pluto wasn't not a planet because that organization said so. Uh, so if the argument's going to be, and according to scientists, trans women are women or whatever else, uh, the reality is it's not correct because the scientists say so. It's correct because the scientists gave a good argument for it. Like, I, I, if somebody gave me that exact same argument, like if some random crazy person on the street gave me that argument before I ever heard it from a scientist, they said Pluto is not a planet because it hasn't cleared its celestial orbit of any other large masses, you know, any other large objects. I would say, you know what? Yeah, that's a good way of understanding why maybe it doesn't make sense to call Pluto a planet because every other thing we consider a planet has kind of cleared, you know, it's got an, an orbit that basically is very much on its own in that orbit. But Pluto, it's surrounded by all these other things going on that orbit at the same time. Yeah, that's a good point. It wouldn't matter if that person was just some, uh, you know, like nobody <laughs> just had no qualifications whatsoever. It's a good definition. The fact that the preeminent organization said so is irrelevant. I just want to point out in case we do get an argument that basically amounts to, and also all of the scientists said that trans women are women. Well, if they don't have a good argument, it's irrelevant. How could Pluto be a planet up until August of 2006, then all of a sudden not be a planet? What changed about Pluto? Nothing changed about Pluto. I mean, I know this is like, I know I'm arguing against, sorry, I hit pause. I know, I know I'm arguing against the point which like, 
obviously Steve Shives isn't sincerely making, but it's worth noting, we all know the answer, right? Pluto didn't change, but rather our understanding of how it makes sense to categorize certain things changed. Um, and that's a, a perfectly uh, valid way of, you know, to, of recategorizing things. This is something I literally spoke about um, in a recent video where I was talking about how like birds are reptiles now. To revise our concept of what a planet was. And that was an option because planet is a constructed concept. It's an idea that people invented that refers to an object that exists out there in the world. Absolutely, 100%. I'm loving this agreement. We're agreeing so much. For that idea to be useful to us, it has to represent that actual object as accurately as possible. Oh, and we're getting into the analytic utility thing too. Oh, blimey, this is really setting up for a, you know, spoiler alert. I think Steve Shires is about to realize that it doesn't really make sense to say that a biological male becomes a woman if they say they are, because that makes uh, analyzing like the reality of gender depression throughout history completely uh, impossible from an, you know, like it, we no longer have any analytic utility to the term woman if the term woman just describes a uh, completely non material feeling in your head. Uh, yeah, hope that, that seems to be where Steve Shire is going here because Steve Shire is admitting one of the things that matters with these terms that we construct is what are they describing and how does our understanding of what they're describing help us to better understand the world. Uh, and certainly, yes, understanding the reality that women are biologically female and men are biologically male helps us understand uh, the you know reality of misogyny, patriarchy, things like this, which were biological males oppressing biological females very often because they were biologically female. And if not uh, directly because of that, at least indirectly, because the fact they were biologically female is the way that they were identified as women. So yeah, seems like, let's see. And if through the gaining of new information, we learn that our concept is not as accurate as we thought it was, the only sensible thing to do is to alter the concept accordingly. Yes, yes, I'm loving this agreement. Ah, oh, you know, I was wondering why is it I used to agree with Steve Shives? I'm like, oh, it's because Steve Shives is just so correct. Look at all these, this correctness that's happening. Okay, let's go, let's go. We treat our idea of the thing as though it is actually the thing. We think of our concept of reality as though it were reality itself. Yes, that is correct. Despite their necessity, our attachment to our constructed concepts can become a problem when we learn new information that challenges the long-held understanding on which those concepts were based. Which brings me to why trans women are women. Okay, okay, you know, I'm, I'm ready. So, so far, Steve Shires hasn't said anything wrong. Everything Steve Shires has been saying has been correct. There's not a single thing that I've had to disagree with. So... Let's see how long it takes for Steve Shires to say something which I do disagree with, because obviously since I don't think trans women are women, or that it makes sense to say trans women are women, uh, I'm, yeah, I'm sure there's got to be a point at which we will disagree, otherwise Steve Shives has really done a bad job in this video. Uh, but yeah, let's see how long it takes. Just as we all grew up in a world where it was an established scientific fact that Pluto was a planet, most of us also were taught to take for granted that gender was a binary concept. Um, okay, what do you mean by gender here? Uh, I don't think I was ever taught, like, I, I'm not sure what you mean by gender here, but I was never taught that gender is a binary concept. Indeed, I think almost everybody has like an idea of there's masculinity and there's femininity, and you can be more or less masculine or feminine. So if that's what you mean by gender, nobody thinks it's binary. That like no like ultimately you can be more masculine, less masculine, blah blah blah. If by gender you mean sex, which I guess it can't be what you mean though, because that would mean trans women aren't women. That obviously is a binary. But yeah, obviously you you can't mean that because that would mean and and yeah okay let's see I'm I'm confused because the term hasn't been defined. But let's see. There were men and there were women. And there were easily discernible factors that determined who belonged in which category. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I'm with this. So basically here, gender just means are you a man or a woman? Uh, and obviously, essentially what Steve Shives is saying here is that most people were raised to believe, um, yeah, it's, it's not quite clear as Steve Shives is saying it, so I'll just kind of restate the point. Uh, basically, most people are raised in the West 
uh, to believe that uh, whether you are a man is the reference there is that you are biologically male. And if you're a woman, the reference there, what is being described by the claim I'm a woman is I am biologically female. And of course, being biologically male or biologically female, that is a binary. Uh, and that's why, therefore, most people grow up believing there is a binary, you're either a man or a woman. So, okay, yeah, I'm clear on that. And I agree that is a thing most people believe with very good reasons, let's see. There are several widely known and practiced methods for distinguishing men from women. The most obvious difference between the genders in the minds of most people is our genitalia. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, obviously, the thing is, it, it, it is complicated, as I already said. Um, and, I mean, I already kind of referred to the reality that defining uh, exactly what it is that makes somebody male or female is basically the art of working out, uh, working from our intuitive understanding that there are males and there are females. Uh, and it's pretty obvious, for example, that I am a male. Uh, it, you know, you can get into the nitty gritty of what exactly is it that makes me a male. But one thing that you probably wouldn't be able to deny, certainly, I mean, especially if you have like a full physical of me and you knew everything about me, maybe right now you could perhaps uh, believe that I'm just a very convincing uh, trans-identified female. But obviously, if you knew everything about me, everything about my history, everything else, you would be like, well, based on knowing everything about this person, I know they're biologically male. But if somebody would say, well, what is the exact thing that you learned about them, which convinced you they're biologically male, that might be more difficult. Uh, as I've always said, well, been saying more recently, because I think it's a good definition, uh, what makes somebody a male or female is the uh, gamete that their phenotype is organized around facilitating the function of in reproduction. So for me, uh, my phenotype is organized around facilitating the function of the small gamete in reproduction. Uh, and there are many aspects of that. Uh, and obviously what you do, therefore, is you look at things holistically. So I have uh, obviously male genitalia. I have probably, you know, I've not got it checked, but I would imagine I've got a decent amount of testosterone. Uh, all that, I mean, you know, I have male gonads, blah, 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 blah. What's the consequence of this? Well, it means that uh, I should, when the time comes, be able to, based on my phenotype, facilitate the function of the small gamete in reproduction. I have a fiance who is biologically female, and she should, all things going well, be able to facilitate the function of the large gamete in sexual reproduction. Uh, your phenotype is an expression of your genotype. And yeah, this is just, you look at things holistically. And of course, it would be possible, perhaps, that I maybe have somewhere tucked away some ovarian tissue. Maybe I have some kind of a difference of sexual development, which means that my, uh, you know, the expression of my chromosomes and the configuration of my chromosomes is different from what is the standard male carrier type, which is XY. Uh, maybe I have something else going on. But the point is that what makes the difference between whether somebody's male or female is the uh, relevance of this for uh, the organization of your body around facilitating the role of a certain phenot uh, certain gamete rather in reproduction. That's the, I think, best way of understanding whether somebody is uh, male or female. And it does mean that in practice, there is actually a very strict binary uh, around these issues. But yeah, let's see what Steve has to say. As anyone who's seen Kindergarten Cop can tell you, boys have a penis and girls have a vagina. Another way is by the size of the gametes an individual produces. Gametes are the cells that fuse together during fertilization and sexual reproduction. Females produce the larger gametes, which we call ova. Not necessarily. No, not every female has to be able to produce the large gamete. Rather, a female has to have a phenotype, which is her body, it's her biology, organized around facilitating the function of producing a large gamete. And that is, you know, obviously it's the difference between uh, something being a working refrigerator, something being a broken refrigerator, and something not being a refrigerator at all. The difference is, if you have a broken refrigerator, it may not be able to keep food cold, but you can still tell that it is, it is organized around the function of keeping food cold. Likewise, a biological female may not be able to produce large gametes, but you can still tell that her phenotype is organized around the function of uh, producing, and of course, uh, otherwise facilitating the function of large gametes in uh, sexual reproduction. So that's an important distinction. And of course, I don't think I have to go through the whole thing about this, how this does not mean that there is some moral reason why women should be expected to uh, engage in this. It's just the reality of we are sexually reproductive organs, or organisms rather, and because we produce uh, sexually, uh, it means that we need to actually have parts of our body designated towards that function. And that's the way we distinguish between being biologically male and biologically female.
And still another way is by sex chromosomes, also called allosomes. The cells of females carry two X allosomes, while the cells of males carry an X and... Uh, so I already pointed out to somebody, this is a terrible, terrible way of distinguishing sex because um, it, it is speciesist. Um, so yeah, I was in a conversation with somebody just today and on my YouTube comments and I pointed out this is a very bad way of defining sex because not all sexually reproductive species uh, have sex chromosomes. For example, many reptiles, including all crocodiles and all turtles, uh, don't have uh, sex chromosomes. Uh, there, there is no chromosomal difference between males and females. And of course, uh, we all know that biological sex does not just exist in humans, and any definition we have of biological sex can't just describe human beings. It has to describe all species that reproduce uh, sexually, because all species that reproduce sexually have two biological sexes, male and female, and nothing else. So yeah, that's just a point to bear in mind. This is not a good definition at all because it doesn't even apply to all species. You're either a man or you're a woman and it's easy to tell which is which. Most people regard the gender binary as a fundamental fact of life. It's so weird the use of the word gender here because of course I would assume what Steve Shives is going to argue is that whether you're a man or woman is irrelevant to whether you're biologically male or biologically female. The route that Steve Shives is going down right now would seem to only really offer up the possibility that there are some exceptional uh, people with differences of sexual development who could be described as intersex, who might therefore be considered neither male nor female. But right now, it seems like all of this stuff about biological sex being ambiguous is kind of irrelevant because my question to Steve would be, do you base your affirmation of transgender identities in the ambiguity of biological sex? I don't see how you possibly could, seeing as a great many people who are trans-identified do not have ambiguous biological sex. So let's see. It's basic biology. It's one of the first things we learn about ourselves. It's a major influence on how we organize our societies and how we perceive each other. Boy, girl, penis, vagina, sperm, egg. It's worth noting, it would still be true even if it was not some big, massive thing in our society. Uh, that it is a big, massive thing in our society uh, means that it is uh, far more important in terms of like uh, sociological, analytical utility that we recognize the distinction between men and women. Uh, when you talk about feminism and patriarchy and misogyny, it's very important we're able to speak clearly about who is a man and who is a woman. But it's also true that even if there was no society at all and therefore no idea of like misogyny or patriarchy or sexism, which of course do not exist in the animal kingdom, for many years, for the billions of years before human beings existed, uh, there were still males and females. So yeah, the distinction would exist regardless of its uh, significance within our culture. Although yes, that it is significant within our culture is not an irrelevant factor. XX, XY, it's familiar, it's comfortable, it's common knowledge, and it's not it not only is it familiar, it's not about being familiar or comfortable or common knowledge. It's also um, intuitive and also uh, kind of objective. You know, it's just, it's something that is entirely like the issue of it being uh, like supposedly comfortable is that it's actually just an accurate way of describing reality. And that's its main benefit. Let's see. Not fully representative of reality. In 1972, Dr. Albert de la Chapelle published a paper in the American Journal of Human Genetics titled Nature and Origin of Males with XX Sex Chromosomes. Yeah, like I say, um, so again, this, this would be a good response against somebody who thinks that chromosomes, but like I say, the other very good response for anybody who remembers that human beings aren't the only species that exist on the planet, which you think, you'd think more people would be able to remember, but whatever, um, is to point out that there are plenty of uh, species which have uh, sexual dimorphism, but not uh, any kind of distinction chromosomal between males and females. The paper was a review of data relating to individuals who, for the most part, were typically male, but who carried XX allosomes. Today, this condition is called XX male syndrome. Wow, sounds like it exclusively affects biological males. Sounds like it actually affirms the reality of the sex binary. As I've pointed out before, 
these differences in sexual development don't uh, get rid of the sex binary or mean that we shouldn't believe in the sex binary. They reaffirm the sex binary because these differences of sexual development will often only affect one sex or the other. And the differences, the, the effects they have will often be uh, different depending on whether they're affecting males or females, uh, if they don't just affect males or females. So the point being that actually, again, you have another example of a binary where these differences of sexual development either affect males or females. They don't affect males to increasing degrees as they become more male along the you know sex spectrum, which of course in reality doesn't exist. Uh, yeah, differences of sexual development. The fact that even when somebody is XX, we can still tell that they are male, shows how strong the sex binary is. And it occurs in about 1 in 20,000 men. There's a similar condition called XY gonadal dysgenesis, or Swire syndrome if you prefer, the result of which is women who carry XY allosomes. Steve! Stevie, 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 Stevie. What do you mean women? What, what do you mean women? I don't really know why you've chosen to go down this path uh, that seems to have been leading to you conflating being a woman with being biologically female. Uh, but it sounds like what you're actually describing is a phenotypical biological female who has an XY chromosome, and you're the person who's choosing to identify such people as women. So I don't know how you're going to kind of start affirming trans identity after that, but let's see. Swire syndrome is even less common than XX male syndrome, affecting approximately 1 in 80,000 women. Swire syndrome also frequently... I just want to point out, even just there, it pointed out that... Uh, these things can cause like medical complications. And like that's an example of how, again, when we're talking about uh, categorizing biological sex, one thing we need to consider is intended and viable functions of the human body. Because if something is not an intended or viable function, then it actually often is problematic and therefore is not something that we really need to account for in our understanding of biological sex uh, or biological classifications in general. Uh, so yeah, that's just the point. I mean, like, obviously people talk about, like, the whole, uh, human beings have ten toes, or rather, you know, ten fingers and ten toes, regardless of the fact that some people might have more or less due to, you know, whatever complicating genetic factors. The point is, that's not the, you know, we recognize what the functional human, uh, phenotype is when it comes to the number of digits. Both of these conditions are extremely rare. Of the approximately 130 million people born every year around the world, only about 4,000 will have either XX. Which is already kind of weird, because if your argument here is that, like, as we have more knowledge, we need to kind of change our, uh, our classifications of things scientifically, I can't help but notice that when you're talking about changing planets, we're talking about an instance where there were nine planets, and with one out of nine, which is not extremely rare at all, uh, we were already running into issues of how that classification needed to be revised. Whereas you're suggesting these examples, which are you know at best one in 20,000, uh, should be motivating us to really reassess how we're understanding these classifications. Now, I want to stress that I think a good classification should account for all variability. Um, but obviously, also, we shouldn't ignore the reality of how those, you know, we shouldn't ignore the uh, frequency of variation, and that should be something we attempt to factor. You know, we shouldn't base our entire idea of biological sex around these incredibly infrequent things, because that would not be a good way to do science, to just focus uh, overwhelmingly on these rare examples. But yeah, it's just interesting to me that uh, the example you've started off with, Pluto being a planet, that's an example of a variation in our understanding of what it means to be a planet, which was actually quite common in that of nine planets we'd have, that we've observed in our solar system, one of them was already nothing like any of the other planets, so we had to change our definition to accommodate that. Uh, whereas here you're talking, like I say, one in 20,000. Male syndrome or Swire syndrome. But the prevalence of these conditions isn't the point. The point is, people who have these conditions are still regarded as genuine members of their genders. Well, again, like I, I, the use of the word gender here just seems like it's creating unnecessary problems in terms of, but whatever, okay. Uh, yes, sure. What's the, I'm, okay, I don't know what the issue is. Let's see. Men with XX male syndrome are still men. Yes. Women with Swire syndrome are still women.
Yes, yes. Now, how does that... But they're, they're still women because they're biologically... This makes no sense. If your argument is... like, If you're supposed to be pivoting at some point here to arguing that biological males are in fact women or can be women, then your argument that um, being biologically female is such a relevant factor that even when you have all of these differences of sexual development, you're still a woman, it seems like you're the one who is um, like actually affirming the relevance of biological sex when it comes to somebody being a woman. Like, you're doing my job for me here, Steve, and I don't know why. To be fair, I will point out, I'm not even sure if Steve has said anything that I would strictly disagree with here. I, I mean, okay, I, well, the issue is Steve has kind of spoken about like other people's definitions of biological sex um, and said that they're simplistic, and I would tend to agree. Uh, but yeah, like so far, I don't think Steve's even actually made like overwhelmingly here so far in this video, Steve has actually agreed with me and we're over halfway through and a fair bit over halfway through. Their existence is evidence that gender isn't always determined by the type of sex chromosomes a person carries. Yes, but it also would seem to be evidence that it is determined by your biological sex. Because again, you're, the thing you seem to be focusing on here is that these people, despite their sex chromosomes, are still considered biologically male or biologically female based on other things, in reality their phenotype, which is being observed. Chromosomal sex determination may be a reliable method in general, and the XX equals woman, XY equals man dichotomy might account for the great majority of people, but it doesn't include everyone. And by the way, neither do the boys have a penis, girls have a vagina, or women make eggs, men make sperm dichotomies. Here's the issue. You're saying all of this, but again, you clearly are able, like, you are buying into this idea that we still have a very good idea of who's biologically male or who's biologically female, because you are describing examples where people, despite being XX, are still observed to be biologically male. Here's my issue. If you're saying um, that... Like, all you're doing is presenting problems by saying, well, this doesn't work perfectly as a definition of what's, what makes somebody biologically male or biologically female, but you don't seem to actually be even attempting to suggest or argue that uh, the categories of biological male or biological female aren't uh, quite established and quite strictly defined categories, you seem to even be accepting that, like I say, by bringing up examples of people who, despite having uh, chromosomal configurations which would seem to contradict what you would expect based on them being biologically male, are nonetheless recognized to be biologically male. So my question would be, considering you're willing to um, present that as the actual science, why do you think these people are recognized as biologically male? Spoiler alert, it is because of what I laid out, the fact that their phenotype is organized around facilitating the function of small gametes and reproduction. That's the reason why. And yes, a man could not have a penis or lose a penis or be castrated or anything else. Um, that's why. But the thing is, like I say, uh, the phenotype uh, organized around facilitating the function of, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you know, I'll just say phenotype to keep it short. The phenotype already accounts for all of that. So yeah, that that would seem to be the correct definition, and is the definition that would best explain what we're seeing from scientists, which is a recognition of the reality of biological sex, even when accounting for all of this variation you're describing. Reality, as it turns out, is a lot more complex than that. It's currently estimated that we're like we're nowhere near close to. First of all, like thus far, we haven't even got the suggestion that trans-identified biological males are women, nor that trans-identified biological females are men. We haven't even got a suggestion of that claim, although I imagine we're about to get onto it now, I would hope. Uh, but then on top of that, we st like we still have to get to the question of, can you show why this would be in some way similar and you know analogous to our recognition that Pluto is not a planet? I need to go make dinner in a sec. That approximately one out of every 250 adults in the United States is transgender. That means their gender identity, their personal internal experience of their gender, is different than the gender they were assigned at birth. <sighs> okay, um, it, it's, it's a bit weird though, because like I say, you still haven't really defined gender, and you're saying like their experience of gender, but according to you, the I guess gender is just whether or not you're a man or woman, right? That seemed to be how you define gender. You're either a man or, well... 
the quality of being either a man or a woman or something else. That seems to be how you're defining gender. You did seem to want to relate that a lot to sex, but I assume that was you kind of granting that as a hypothetical to try and argue against that position. So, okay, I'm going to say fine that. So with that said, if your reference for whether somebody's a man or woman is not biological sex, then what actually is it? Like, what do you think? When I say I'm a man, what do you think I'm saying? The issue is if you say, well, you're telling me about your experience of being a man. But it's like, well, hold on a minute. How can I have an experience of something if that's not a clearly defined thing? Uh, you know, like you can't just say that your experience of something defines you being that thing because that is circular. Of course it's circular. Uh, you know, like, for example, we can talk about somebody's experience of being black because we already have a referent for what it means to be black. We can talk about somebody's experience being a Christian because we already have a referent for what it means to be Christian. Uh, we all, you know, so on and so on. Somebody's, you know, if somebody tells me their experience as a 12 year old, then the reason why I know what they're talking about is because I know what it means to be a 12 year old. It means somebody who has been alive for 12 years. Um, or does it? I can't, I'm not sure about like the fact that you're technically zero when you're born. So I guess over 12 years, whatever. Anyway, uh, the point is like, I, I know what somebody is saying when they tell me that. But if somebody tells me they're a woman and then I say, okay, what what does that mean? And they say, well, it means that my experience is that of a woman. Then the problem is, you'll notice the only way that I knew what it meant for somebody to tell me their experiences of being black or a Christian or 12 years old is that I already knew what it meant to be black or a Christian or 12 years old. But if I don't know what it means to be a woman, and the only definition you're giving for me for what it means to be a woman is your experience of being a woman, that doesn't mean anything. I, I still don't know what it is you're describing. Um, so, so yeah, I, I don't know, like, it, it's meaningless. You're, you're, you're offering up a definition which isn't actually a definition because I'm still left going, so wait, what does that mean though? What are they actually describing? The prefix trans comes from Latin and means on the other side of. So a transgender person is someone who is on the other side of their assigned gender. People like- But what do you, again, what does it mean? What does it mean to have a gender? Because again, for me, this is, well, uh, the word gender is so confusing that I would not use it as liberally as you're using it because I just think it creates unnecessary confusion. What I would say is that whether you're a man or woman, the referent for that is whether or not you're biologically male or biologically female. And that makes sense. Everyone can understand what I'm saying there. There's no real confusion. With what you're saying, I literally have no idea what you're on about. What do you mean assigned gender? What is gender? Again, if it's just whether you're a man or woman, then I would say, well, what were they describing when they assigned you that? And if they're describing biological sex, then why are you then saying that biological sex isn't the referent for whether you're a man or woman? It doesn't make any sense. And if you say, well, it's because they have the experience of not being a man, then I would say, but if biological sex is the original referent and they are, in fact, they do have that biological sex, then how can you say that their experience is of a biological sex which they don't have? That doesn't make any sense. That's like me talking about my experience of having black skin. It doesn't make any sense. Like me, who do identify with the gender we were assigned at birth, that is, people who are not trans, are called cisgender. Cis is a prefix that also comes from the Latin, and it means on the same side of. So cis people are those of us who are on the same side as our assigned gender. Okay, so I went on a little hypothetical about like cis alpine ghoul, which was supposed to be humorous, but it didn't really end up being, so I'm probably not going to include it. But I did just think to myself, like, that's an interesting kind of um, counter to that. Obviously, cis alpine ghoul was so called because for the Romans who spoke Latin, it was their side of the Alps and it was ghoul. It was ghoulier on their side of the Alps, whereas um, uh, trans alpine ghoul was ghoulier on the other side of the Alps. The thing is, you'll notice there how this is an example of cis and trans being used uh, with a clear referent. What means you are trans alpine? That you are the other side of the Alps. What, mean, what means you are cis alpine? That you are this side of the Alps, that you are in Italy, in Rome. Uh, and if you wanted to go from being cis alpine to trans alpine, you would cross the Alps. The Alps here representing the clear, very obvious, very striking, if you've ever seen them, referent. Uh, whereas conversely, when we're talking about cisgender versus transgender, gender ain't no Alps. It's not some clearly defined thing. And, uh, you know, no, that's being too generous. It's not a defined thing at all. Never mind clearly. It's not being defined in any sense at all as Steve is presenting it. What do you mean when you say gender? When you tell me you're a man, what are you saying? When you tell me somebody's a woman, 
What are you saying? When you tell me a biological male is a woman, why are they a woman? What is it you are actually saying? It doesn't make any sense. And to relate this to the whole Pluto thing again, when somebody tells me that something is a planet, I have some concept of what they are saying. Like, every single thing in the whole Pluto debate, there's no point at which I just go, well, what are you talking about? What do you mean? There's no, like, words in the whole Pluto debate which just have no meaning at all and no real referent. It's all pretty easy to work out. But suddenly when we're talking about, uh, you know, transgender identity, I literally have no idea what you're talking about because you haven't defined anything properly. Steve? Hey everybody, so this was a classic start recording the video and then realized I actually wanted it to be a two-parter, mostly because it was it would be a long one-parter. I think admittedly each individual part will probably end up being shorter than my average, but uh, I think it would have been at least an hour and a half without uh, splitting it into two parts. So that's why I'm splitting it into two parts. So it should be, I hope this is about 45 minutes now that I'm talking. Check there, see how, see where it is, because I can't really predict how long this will be once I've edited it down and all that. So yeah, if it's 45 minutes, then well done me. But uh, I'll just say, if you enjoyed the video, please like, share, comment, subscribe, all of that stuff. Um, uh, comment, let me know what you think, of course. Uh, and also, if you want to give on Patreon, that's really appreciated. It helps what I'm doing with this channel tremendously. It gives um, kind of, uh, motivation to keep making videos like this and to keep producing content uh, and also you know maybe you know it's it's just it's just a, a nice little bonus um, and a great way to show your support so I'll just say thank you to my current patrons. In addition to the name scrolling past on your screen right now I would like to give a special thanks to last month's patrons one of whom does not want to be mentioned by name but apart from that Lemonade and Citrus. You're all very appreciated.